Hello, Politics Plus Media 101 listeners. This week, a new president will be inaugurated in Argentina, a controversial, incendiary, charismatic, fascinating president, and that's Javier Millet. We are here speaking with an expert on South American politics and on how South America interacts with the broader world. And that's Dr. Ariel gonzalez Lavaggi. He is a senior associate in the Americas program at CSIS, the Center for Strategic and International Studies. That's a think tank that have provided many of our best guests here in this program. And he is also a professor at the Pontifical Catholic University of Argentina, where he leads a couple of research centers, uh, one being the U.S. Study Program and another being the Center for International Studies. So we're very glad to have you here, Doctor. And I was reading your analysis of what to look for in Latin America in the year 2023, back in January at the start of the year. And I saw that you sort of predicted that there was a possibility that Javier Millet might be indeed elected president of Argentina. Although at the time, it seemed like a remote possibility. It was something that you introduced as far back as a year ago as something that might indeed happen. Well, thank you, John and Justin, for the invitation. Actually, uh, the the, the people, the le- lecturers here were very upset about traditional politics. So something new, something un- like present some rupture with the past was kind of unlikely. So I'm that person, well, this is, will, will be Javier Millet, but uh, yeah, uh, years ago, uh, only a few people really believed that he can achieve this great uh, election and uh, victory at the elections. Uh, so we are talking that this is the most vote president in, in an election, of course, in a Bangladesh, but still is quite important because he present as a person that want to break the system. So something that we've noticed, Doctor, is that in Washington, D.C. and in the media environment that surrounds it, South America and Latin America in general seems to get a lot less attention than it really probably should. For an entire century of U.S. foreign policy, the Western Hemisphere was clearly the priority. The famous Monroe Doctrine by Secretary of State and then President James Monroe said that at the core of U.S. foreign policy should be a U.S. prioritization and interest in the Western Hemisphere and an insistence that other powers from outside, especially those in Western Europe, should not interfere in hemispheric affairs. Until the early 20th century, this was kind of the guiding light of U.S. foreign policy. But today, we don't hear as much as we probably should about our own neighborhood in American news. And the discussion in political debates, in Congress, doesn't focus on the region very much either. This is despite uh, Spanish speakers with connections to Latin America being one of the largest demographic groups in the USA. Meanwhile, American leaders in the media are talking about the Middle East. They're talking about Europe and China and Russia. Why do you think that a region that directly affects the United States more than many of the places we spend so much time talking about seems to get short shrift in Washington, D.C.? Well, this is a very challenging question. Uh, I think, like, as a great power, uh, the U.S. has, like, global problems, global challenges. And this this is not only about the U.S. interests, but also the interests of U.S. allies uh, worldwide. So this like broad expansion of U.S. interests in the Second World War, that's uh, well provided the basis of this uh, kind of liberal or not so liberal international order, uh, puts Latin America aside. Why? Well, because Latin America is not so relevant geopolitically, and what I'm talking is that there is no many conflicts, there are no many like turbulences generated in, in the region that uh, like generate pro- global problems, like the Middle East, for example, with the oil transportation uh, or the uh, Russian invasion of, of Ukraine that puts uh, Europe uh, in danger. So I, I think that it's, it's a matter of priorities. And in that priorities, Latin America is less attractive because uh, paradoxically is more, pa- more peaceful uh, but at the same time, I think that um, even if the U.S. generally don't pay too much attention, I think this uh, argument can apply more to the South American region than to Mexico, for example, or Central America, where there are a lot of attention and there are a lot of politicization about migration, uh, about uh, 
the sources of uh, drugs, uh, trafficking, uh, increasing number of countries that are like moving towards like, less democratic uh, like approaches. So I think South America, I, I think, is the, the forgotten uh, subcontinent in the US foreign policy. At the same time, we are relatively stable. So that, that's un, un, undemocratic in general, despite the cases of Venezuela. Uh, so that makes the region less problematic and less important for the US foreign policy. Well, with the election of President Moai, we've seen interest in Argentina and in South America kind of explode among the political commentariat class in America. So folks that are pro-MAGA, pro-Trump, that maybe don't even know anything about Argentina are handling this as a victory that their supporters should be proud of. Certain folks on the left-hand side of things are decrying the election, uh, predicting doom and gloom. And I think before we get into these approaches, these views on the election, the the president, we should probably understand some historical facts uh, about Argentina. And specifically at the turn of the 20th century, Argentina was one of the wealthiest countries in the world. And, and since then, unfortunately, it's been left behind by countries in Europe, East Asia, even the Middle East in, in some cases. But could you get into what Argentina's golden period was like and how Argentina at one point was one of the economic powers? Well, the, that golden period, the historians in, in Argentina name as the conservative order, uh, in which there was there was few very few families uh, that like creates the basis of a modern state and a modern economy and open up the Argentinian economy, especially exporting uh, like grains and uh, like with, uh, with processes. And, and in that sense, the Argentinian economy was pretty similar, for example, with the Australian, with the Canadian, and with a special relation with the UK. The United Kingdom. So that makes the Argentina uh, in, in that period a kind of a boom because from one uh, from the yeah late nineteenth century towards like nineteen twenties, nineteen thirties. But that period is also explained by the uh, stability, political stability of a I would say oligarchic regime. There was no free elections until nineteen. Uh, 16, and at the same time, a uh, open economy based on the uh, primary good exportations. The problems came when the uh, prices of these primary goods fall in relation with the industrial goods. And Argentina uh, arrived late to the industrialization process, uh, especially in the, in the late, late uh, 30s, early 40s, and that's uh, the role of the state became more important on the one on the one side, so the state pushed for a state lead industrialization. That explains, for example, uh, the Peronism. Uh, that is political movements that uh, hegemonize Argentine politics uh, for for good or for bad reasons uh, from uh, mid forties until recently. Until now, uh, and on the other side, a period of political uh, disturbances, political instability, start with a wave of military coups, uh, in which one of them was uh, made by a group close to Juan Domingo Perón. The, the Peronist movement was uh, based on a group of military that wants the state to be strong want the state to lead the industrialization process. So since the mid-40s, uh, um, the problem is that the, the, the economy uh, and, and the state waste more than the income that they receive. So we have uh, a structural deficits uh, along these this decades, uh, along with the political instability 
Perón, for example, was banned to return to the country after the uh, 1955 coup until 1933. So like almost 20 years in which the main political figure of the country was abroad, in Panama, in Venezuela, in, in Spain. So of course, that creates a lot of problems for the economy uh, because the political equation wasn't, wasn't set. Uh, and after the return of Perón, uh, Perón died a couple of uh, years after he returned and became president. And a very bloody military coup uh, start. Um, and at that time, there was a lot of uh, human rights violations, in addition to a very swift and, and fast opening of, of the economy that start like trying to uh, un, unblock the uh, very a close economy, so try to open up. This military regime ends with the Malvinas Falklands War. And that's it. it's the end for the military, for the political end, and it's the end for the authoritarian regime. And since then, and this year we celebrate 40 years of democracy, different parties, more center-leftist, center-right, uh, arrive to, to the government, try to reform the economy, but the main problem that the, the Argentine uh, people have is that we don't have a real stable economy, we don't have a real stable currency, but we have very stable politics. So Millet creating uh, a lot of uh, expectations about maybe a breakdown of these two Broad trends, political stability, because the uh, narrative is against what he called the casta, uh, the, those who are above, that have all the benefits. He's talking about politicians, uh, traditional politicians. But also he's, uh, there are a lot of concern about how he, how Millet will advance the reforms. He, he will be a kind of a, a moderate, uh, trying to uh, arranged uh, agreement with the different political traditional political parties, or he will rule by uh, by, by the decrees. So um, that's something that I have no answer. But what is real is that Millet is a real breakdown in the trajectory of Argentine politics, Argentine economy, and I hope for, for good. So, Doctor, let's look then just at these last 40 years, the time since the return to democracy that you indicated when the junta left power after their period. In this time, the economy, at least from the outsider's perspective, seems to have really gotten stuck in a rut, a kind of stagflation, as we call it in the United States, where there has been lots of inflation without economic growth. Usually we associate those two things. Inflation comes when there's more money in the economy and there's more economic activity. But here we're seeing something more like what the United States experienced in the 1970s, where you had increasing inflation without the kind of economic growth that, that you associated. Um, this was a time when these two political factions were competing with each other in a fair and open system, but in a predictable way, just as you've described. How do we kind of assess the authorship of these economic problems in that 40-year period, who do you uh, look at as being primarily responsible for this situation that Argentina has been in in that time? Well, okay. I think there are many responsibles um, for all the political spectrum. And I will see something that is very odd, uh, maybe for, for the audience, but we went through two very big crisis in these 40 years. When I'm talking about very big crisis, we are talking about an hyperinflation uh, from 1988 until 1990, in which the uh, outcome of that crisis, the exit, was to create a stable uh, currency system in which one Argentine peso means one Argentine, uh, one US dollar. And that lasts for almost a decade. So that's a huge crisis creates a moment or a decade of stability. That was the Menem, Carlos Menem period. 
he was Peronist and he basically dismantled the state. So the, the, the main party that created the big state was the same party that dismantled. So then we have a second very huge crisis. And I remember because I was a teenager uh, in which at the end of the 2001, uh, in which the this uh, system in which one peso, one dollar one uh, equal each other explodes. That creates uh, incidentally a, a wave of uh, poverty, uh, of really a strong, very strong social uh, problems in which the Peronist party, the same party that dismantled the state, decide to rebuild the welfare state. And to rebuild that welfare state, like increasing the expenditure from the central, the federal government. And that expenditure was increasing year by year. So since 2003 uh, to 2014, uh, the fiscal deficit really start to, to uh, increase a lot. And also the inflation, because the state was printing money uh, without reserves behind it. Uh, so I, I would say that, yes, the, the main the main source of stability and the main source of problems is the Peronism. And that's the main challenge that Javier Millet have to deal with, because in Argentina, you cannot rule without having a support from some part of Peronism. But the bulk of the Peronism is like pro-state, uh, is not so liberal in, in, in economic in terms of economic reforms. Uh, and also we should take into account that syndicates in Argentina are part of the Peronist movement. And the, the, the syndicates, the, the labor unions are very, very strong. So strong that, for example, they stop an agreement with China to uh, allow Chinese workers to work to uh, to be allowed to work in, in the country. Uh, so, and we should add to that social movements uh, that they 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 grow up in, in the last twenty years because of the spread of poverty also are very close to Peronism. So this is a coalition that is very difficult to table, uh, difficult difficult to to rule. Uh, so. Uh, and, and that's why the main challenge that Millet have for, I, I say, will say the first year of his government is to have governability, to rule, and to try to advance reforms. The sitting vice president of Argentina has been sentenced to six years in jail, ruling on a high-profile corruption case. An Argentine court sentenced Vice President Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner. The court also disqualified her from holding public office. The vice president has temporary immunity due to her office. She will not face immediate prison time and is expected to appeal against the judgment, although she could run for office while the appeals are pending. But she says she would not be a candidate in next year's general election. Fernandez Kutner served as president for two terms between 2007 and 2015. She was accused of corruption in awarding public works during her presidency. She has denied the allegations and called the court a firing squad. So before we get into forward-looking analysis of Malay's presidency and, and term to come, you mentioned that there's been great political stability that Malay has promised to upend, hopefully in a good way for Argentina, but there's also been great economic instability. And we've gone through some of the economic instability. The political stability that you mentioned and Malay's relation to it brings to mind for me and, and probably John and our listeners, uh, what we experienced with President Trump's rise, right? We had in 2008, there were 2006, 2008, there was an economic crisis. President Obama came in, stabilized things. And he was a two-term president, which in American terms is political stability. 
President Trump was running against not only Obama's two terms, but Secretary Hillary Clinton, who was described as uh, the figurehead of political stability in America, the establishment candidate. Um, But also, President Trump's messaging was directed at perceived corruption of Clinton and the political establishment. Trump was this outsider. He's going to come in and and destroy things and break things down and drain the swamp was his moniker of getting rid of these politicians that he and the movement label, label as is corrupt. I want to ask if there was any role that perceived political corruption in the establishment uh, politicians in Argentina could have played in the rise of Malay. And specifically, I believe it was in December 2022, uh, the former president Kirchner was sentenced to six years in president uh, in prison. Did this case and um, political corruption in general play a role to the rise of this outsider? Uh, I would say yes, but because Millet rise in a like kind of a post-corruption era, the, and I, we should look to the previous years because in 2015. The Peronism was beaten by a new party, a new coalition called Juntos por el Cambio, uh, when Mauricio Macri became president. Mauricio Macri was a liberal businessman that a part of this agenda was to uh, fight against corruption. And, and in that period, the topic was very, very hot, uh, especially was uh, all the time in the media and their remembrances about the corruption cases were very, very um, fresh. But right now, uh, I will say that this this issue, of course, is part of the the agenda, the concerns of, of, of the voters. But everyone is very, very upset with the political class, traditional political class, because they don't solve basic problems of the people and Basically, I'm saying I'm talking about inflation, and also the 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 currency that devaluates year by year. I will tell you something personal. I I, I did my PhD abroad. I returned to Argentina uh, in, in 2017, and since since that until now, every year we suffer increasing inflation plus devaluation. So that's it's, it's a kind of a snowball. As this is, is growing, it's growing, it's growing. The main issue is that besides corruption, besides privileges of the political like, representatives, uh, we have a structural problem that is the economy, and the economy is broken. So and, and you cannot fight against that. So Justin made a comparison to the election of 2016 in the United States and described how Donald Trump and his campaign portrayed and emphasized the idea that there was corruption around the Clinton family and that he would be the one to stamp this out. And it's interesting how in that case, his election ended up unleashing and enabling an even more extreme form of corruption than really anything that we've seen in in American history. Uh, The first president not to divest from his private businesses, who was accepting millions of dollars in bribes from foreign governments the entire time he was in office. So even while there is discontent against corruption that might be happening in the system, sometimes that discontent can enable much stranger activities that are outside the bounds of ordinary politics. And as we're looking at the newly elected president of Argentina, we see this very strange eccentric person. And I'd love for you, doctor, to help us paint a picture of who this person is. I've been reading a little bit about him and in West, you know, English speaking news sources. And I'm hearing about how he would like to commercialize the sale of organs in the country, how he portrays himself as a tantric sex instructor who engages in orgies and group sex with men and women, how in the middle of interviews, he'll pause because he's hearing a voice from an imaginary ghost, how he has gone under all sorts of strange religious conversions and explorations, depicting the Pope as an evil rat how he has cloned his dogs and created replicas of his dogs that he refers to as his children. Uh, can you help us understand what sort of person Malay is, how he was perceived prior to this stunning election result? Well, I think 
we are Argentinians, we, we, are, we are trying to decipher the, 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 the character. So, because we have one Millet before being politician, one Millet who is, was in campaign, very, very aggressive. And we have two days Millet that is kind of a lossy, very soft, moderate. Uh, so it's, it's, it's changing. But what, 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 what is important to uh, underline is that Millet is a liberal. Uh, it's a libertarian, but it's kind of uh, traditional liberalism uh, can be portrayed in, in the country um, in which they want reduce the state uh, like an, an open economy and opportunities for private sector. So this is a kind of a very anti-systemic ideology because the main train ideology is uh, the statism, uh, which is backed by the, the Peronism. Uh, so being a liberal is being revolutionary. So and he really believes that he is a, a, a person that wants to change Argentina from roots because she is proposing a way that is against the system. And actually, he won elections against almost every uh, corporation in the country, from like traditional businessmen to to to, to social movements and, and the parents party itself. So, and what we are looking in the, the confirmation, the construction of the cabinet is that it's a very pragmatic. So, I think the crazy melee that uh, we they are used to to listen when he was rock star, not very popular, by the way. Well, these days have passed and now is in his new role. But it's really a question mark. I know that Justin has a follow up here, but be, just before uh, Justin asks the question, I just want to mention that it's interesting how many of these populist leaders have some kind of background in television. Um, I noticed, of course, uh, Donald Trump's long tenured career as a television host in the US on reality TV competition show, The Apprentice, but also Boris Johnson in the UK. He's not a populist maybe in the same way that Trump and Malay are, a, a, an extreme eccentric, but he's someone who got a lot of his political support initially because of popular appearances on the comedy news show, Have I Got News For You? And then in France, there was Eric Zemmour who ran for president, who was really a far-right extremist. And he built his political uh, persona out of television appearances. I think there's lots of other examples too. I know that Matteo Salvini in Italy also appeared on some game shows early in his career. So this medium of television is certainly a powerful tool to be exploited by uh, aspiring politicians, especially of the sort of populist charismatic type. So Javier Mille is extremely scary. That's what the legacy media have decided. Newly elected libertarian conservative leader of Argentina is absolutely frightening. Axios calls him a far-right libertarian who's been compared to Trump. The New York Times writes, Argentina braces itself for its new anarcho-capitalist president. Braces itself. They call the election Argentina's Donald Trump moment. Who, asks the Washington Post, is Javier Mille, Argentina's far-right president-elect. Here was the coverage from NBC News. A controversial figure known by his fans as the crazy and the wig for his larger-than-life personality and hair. At times, compared to Brazil's president, Jair Bolsonaro, and former U.S. president, Donald Trump, who congratulated Malay on his victory, writing, quote, make Argentina great again on his truth social platform. Trump congratulated him. This means he is scary. An economic crisis worsening by the day. Argentina becoming unaffordable for essentially its whole population, suffering 104% annual inflation, according to its official statistics agency. Yo veo mucha gente necesitada. A lot of people in need, people in the streets, and a need for more jobs, said this man, as his country holds the unsettling place of second worst inflation in Latin America, only behind Venezuela. I do want to get into the 
juxtaposition that you presented for us from campaign Malai to current day Malai, because you've said that he's there's this concerted effort to bring in pragmatism from the, the crazy campaign and, and all of these promises, which that's what Trump world sold to us when I was working on the 2016 campaign, that this is just all campaign and he'll moderate. Obviously, Trump just got crazier <laughs> as he got power and, and was in office. So back to the campaign, Malay. There were some massive economic proposals made on the campaign. We heard about switching the country's currency to the greenback, eliminating the central bank, uh, and removal from the common market uh, McCursor. Do these proposals still hold weight with pragmatic Malay? And what are your views on, on some of these proposals? The problem is that Malay has a nuclear bomb, a nuclear economic bomb in his hands. Um, that the previous governments, uh, to, to win the elections, they spend three points of the uh, GDP in, in three, four months. So the inflation was, was terrible, yes, but it will be worse in, in, in the next month. We are talking about maybe 30% of inflation in January. So it's crazy. And this is beyond Millet. So first, Millet needs to try to uh, solve uh, the situation that this, this inflation is uh, foreign debt. So I think that if Millet solves the problems, that's, then yeah, I have to be honest, it will be very tough. And if uh, the political establishment, some part of the political establishment don't support him, it will be, uh, even impossible. But if you, if Millet does have that ocean issues, uh, that uh, great uh, proposals uh, will be out of the agenda permanently. So in your assessment as an analyst of Argentina's economy, do you think that some of these flashy, high profile proposals would have a positive impact if they were successfully executed? Uh, switching from the Argentinian peso to the U.S. dollar as a currency. I mean, I witnessed this uh, in Zimbabwe. I remember visiting Zimbabwe and seeing the the dollar bills that said $10 trillion because of how bad the inflation was. And I, I recall that they switched the U.S. dollar to try to get out of the habit of printing off new money every month and adding on three more zeros. Uh, do you think this would work? I'm not sure in Zimbabwe if it I think it ended the immediate inflationary crisis, but now they're in a situation where they need tourists to come in and spend money for them to have currency to circulate inside their borders. That's the main issue. So Argentina don't have the, the Fed that print money. Uh, and it's, it's a big country. The, the economy is in the G20, uh, within the 30 biggest economies. Um, the problem is that we always need more uh, foreign uh, currency to maintain our the stability of, of our currency. So the proposal of Millet is don't spend more than you waste. Um, and uh, in, in, that, in that context of stability, you can polarize the economy. Uh, I am uh, not so optimistic because you... For the, the 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 amount of economy is, is huge, and you need, I think, a uh, very politically strong uh, support from from the treasury. So this is not like uh, switching from one day to the other. Uh, you need support from the White House, support from the U.S. Treasury, um, and 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 that's I think for a country that is so unstable. Like, Economically, like Argentina, is something that requires a lot of efforts, and you need to show results. So you you need to, you need to show that you are not overexpending, that you are doing market reforms that are that have some consensus in the political arena, um, and this is why I am not so optimistic. So you mentioned that there's an economic nuclear bomb waiting to go off that Malay has been left with from the previous regime. You mentioned that some of the bigger proposals like uh, switching over to the greenback will require 
trust building, uh, reforms that show progress and, and will need to come after the nuclear bomb has been dealt with. Does Malay have any tools in the toolbox to deal with the nuclear bomb and defuse it? Or is it inevitable that the, that the economic situation is going to deteriorate uh, and there's really nothing that the current president can do to stop it? The coin is in the air. So Malay have uh, arranged a, a good team. I've sent some very interesting messages uh, to Wall Street uh, and to IMF. Millet will do something that even the IMF don't ask to, to do. And that's very odd because Argentina is kind of a, a systemic liar to, to the, to the world, but to the internal, international monetary fund. So, and this, the, for example, this government that is, is leaving the next days, they signed two, uh, IMF uh, agreements, sorry, sorry, three, and they didn't uh, fulfill the what they they signed. So, of course, uh, uh, I, there is an issue of trust uh, that no one wants to to really deal, especially the IMF staffers with Argentina, because uh, it's, it seems that this kind of a weak paper that you sign it, but on the next day it's broken. Um, so. In that sense, uh, I think that Millet team will, I think, will do the best to deal with the situation. But I, I think that this, that this crisis can go beyond the the abilities. But and this is the the time when uh, foreign investors, foreign supports, like the White House, can play a role and can save uh, that uh, situation because Argentina. The Milan's Argentina will need a lot of external support. Uh, but of course, we ask money for everyone. So uh, the, we have le- or very small uh, options. At the same time, for example, Argentina depends uh, on China a lot. More than 50% of our currencies, our foreign currencies, are in yuans, renminbi. So that's something that people don't realize it. So half of our reserves that, by the way, are in negative, are belong to the Chinese. Um, so I, I think that the challenges are very, very uh, over the, the Millet's capabilities. But as a Argentina, I hope he, he can uh, solve this economic nuclear problem. So in a past lifetime, uh, right out of college, I was a lobbyist for Seaboard Corporation, which is a large U.S. agricultural investor, largest actually in the continent of Africa. And I believe it was at the time the largest U.S. agricultural investor in Latin America as well. Um, but we would deal with you know, uh, governments in Africa who were trying to get a direct investment from the IMF that had economic and political instability and the way that these governments would go about it and the IMF in these meetings with us is they would ask our company to guarantee a loan or uh, help secure financing from, you know, United States banks to go and give a loan to the Democratic Republic of Congo so that they could build, you know, a couple billion dollar agriculture park for one specific example of this. And uh, Seaboard Corporation would obviously decline because the uh, you know there was too much risk involved with helping secure these investments. You mentioned that there needs to be some foreign direct investment in Argentina to help the situation that there probably could be some investment from the White House. Are there any incentives that Malai and Argentina can give to these actors, whether it be private companies, private banks, the White House, uh, that would incentivize or entice this type of economic investment? Maybe Argentina shifting away from China and closer to the United States geopolitically. Is there anything that can be done to, to help make this hope a reality? Yes. And I will say in, in two fronts. In the domestic front, MLA will advance uh, in, for example, the privatization of state companies. So there is an opportunity. Uh, for example, MLA uh, talk, if I am wrong, yesterday with Elon Musk, uh, and 
well, that, that's kind of a, a direct, direct uh, approach trying to bring SpaceX or, or Satellink and, and, and some of the, of the companies. Uh, but the other, and, and this is more important, the geopolitical one, uh, I think Argentina will move to a, a direct alignment with the White House, and not only in the Western Hemisphere, but globally. So there are a lot of rumors that President Zelensky from Ukraine will attend uh, the presidential inauguration. And that is a clear sign that Argentina will play with the U.S. Um, and at the same time, the relation with China will be tense. Millet had very tough declarations saying that he won't do business with the communists. <laughs> and I'm talking about China as a communist country. So kind of banning state-to-state relations. Of course, that uh, was moderated in, in, in the last days. But of course, for example, Argentina, it seems that won't uh, join the BRICS. That is a kind of a situation in which Argentina is saying no to China because China was the one that pushed for inviting Ar- uh, the country to the BRICS. So uh, Argentina can play the Western card, but uh, well, uh, this is a tango, and tango needs two to to dance. And I don't know how how many will there will be in in the White House to support uh, Millet and to support Argentina. But you know, here U.S. domestic politics brings in, and you have this. Trump's connection, Bolsonaro connection, that uh, seems not to be so uh, attractive. And um, actually, there, there was a uh, a message when Millet visits Sullivan that please don't don't play with U.S. domestic politics. So don't don't play with Trump. Um, and that is a moderation force. Uh, a, 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 you know, a force that can create a, a moderate melee. I, I think that's really interesting. I'm sure that many people listening to this program in Washington, D.C. or elsewhere will be glad to hear that there's an opportunity to improve relations between the USA and Argentina with this election. But you've also indicated the comparison to Brazil and how even though Bolsonaro, the leader of Brazil, indicated that he wanted to get closer to the USA. A lot of Americans were reluctant to work closely with Bolsonaro because of his anti-democratic rhetoric and indeed some of his anti-democratic actions. And I think one of the reasons why people in the USA were concerned about Bolsonaro from the start was that Bolsonaro, even when a candidate, even early in his career, when he was in the legislature in Brazil, would praise and echo the dark period of Brazilian history during the military junta. Uh, This is something that we've also seen from other far-right candidates in South American countries. In Chile, there was Cass who ran, and he would praise the the Pinochet era. We had a candidate in Peru who was the daughter of Alberto Fujimori, who was praising that dark period in Peruvian history. Uh, We were talking earlier in the program about how Argentina also has this history of military juntas, uh, in particular, the 1970s is a time that many Americans might know about um, Argentina's dark chapter there, the Dirty War, and so on. Does Malay, similar to Cass and Bolsonaro and Fujimori, echo and praise the period of military junta? Is that also part of his public profile? That is a very interesting question because Malay itself is not connected uh, with the the, the, the all military, and I will say something more. He's he's not connected, for example, with the uh, evangelist movement. Um, he's like uh, with very good relation with some rabbis uh, Judah, from Judaism. Now is in relatively good relation with the Pope. Uh, that the Pope will visit Argentina. It seems next year. So, but. His vice president, her vice uh, vice president, Victoria Villarroel, 
he is connected with, with the military. Actually, he defended the victims of guerrilla terrorism during the 70s. Uh, that, of course, pushed in, in the other side with the human rights organizations. But uh, one of the first steps after winning the election uh, was to neutralize the vice president. So this is something interesting, uh, but Millet is trying to show that he's not like Bolsonaro, he's not like uh, other like uh, ultra far right uh, personas, but he's an economist with that came from middle class, but he used part of this uh, support that the, the vice president, the, the elect vice president rally to go to, to, to arrive to the presidency. But the, the person that we will meet of defense shows that uh, this consensus, democratic consensus uh, on human rights uh, and like uh, civil accountability of military will continue. You also mentioned that Malay toned down and moved on from some of the cooperation with China that was already in action, uh, the effort to join BRICS and so on, uh, partly because he refuses to work with communists, as he characterized it. Uh, He doesn't want to work with communists, so he doesn't want to work with China. I'm curious how that will affect Malay's relations in his own neighborhood. As we know, the leader of Brazil right now is Lula da Silva, who comes from the Workers' Party, from the labor movement, from a socialist movement that has Marxist overtones. Uh, the neighbor to the West, Chile, is also now led by Gabriel Boric, who is a left-wing populist leader. These two leaders came into power as part of a broader regional trend that's called the pink wave, where Marxist leaders were being elected in South America many countries all around the same time. Um, I'm curious if you think the pink wave is over, whether the election of Millet and the setbacks that have happened in other countries like Chile and Peru um, indicate that the wave has crested and there's no more momentum for left-wing movements. And I'm curious how Millet is going to interact with left-wing leaders like Lula and Boric. I, I think I saw a story that Lula is refusing to attend the inauguration. So I'd, I'd like to know how he's going to fit into this regional trend. It's complex because um, the, the pink tide is, is, uh, has been not so strong as in the past. In 2010, for example, with the first Lula with Chavez in Venezuela. Uh, so right now, there are a lot of criticism. For example, the Chilean president Boric has very low support. Uh, the same happened with uh, Petra in Colombia. So what we are uh, witnessing right now is a process in which uh, political the patience of the voters are uh, very limited. So uh, they don't choose uh, for left for the left. They choose against something, and that makes me like the new president. They vote against Peronism. They vote against uh, a kind of a center-left coalition led by by Massa. Um, and, and in Brazil, the people vote against Bolsonaro. Uh, many that they have very bad image of, of Bolsonaro. Lula too, but Lula have really more support. Uh, so I, I think that's uh, it's difficult to to uh, name this as a, as a kind of a wave or counter wave. What we are looking is in like political changes, and that makes very interesting the, the Latin American political spectrum because it's very democratic. We have a political change between officialism and opposition, and that's very positive. And that's I will say something that make that. that that can create the basis for uh, a more democratic region uh, in the future. Of course, um, Millet had, had to deal with a, a, a region that is not favorably in, in ideological terms. Ideology matters in Latin America, especially how you deal with the U.S., 
how, how do you deal with Israel, for example? Argentina Millet say that he will move the uh, embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. But like uh, imi imitating the Trump's uh, actions. Uh, so Millet chose, uh, has chosen sorry, a uh, mutual foreign affairs that is very, very moderate. Uh, for example, uh, after Lula say that he won a 10, the inauguration because he felt uh, kind of an insult because Bolsonaro will be the uh, Diana Mondino, who is the uh, who he will be the future Minister of Foreign Affairs, traveled to Brazil and met with the Ministry uh, of Foreign Affairs uh, of, of Brazil. Uh, he uh, had a meeting with Chinese uh, diplomatic officials. So um, I think that it will be kind of a two-track diplomacy on one side, the presidential one that will be will be polemic, and uh, it will be very tactical, uh, trying to uh, take advantage of the moment. But at the same time, there will be another more institutional, uh, more grounded in the Argentine diplomatic traditions that will try to maintain the relation with everyone, even if at the, the higher level won't be so easy as in the past. So before we uh, ask one or two last questions on uh, Venezuela, I do want to just ask one final question on Argentina and Malay. The word you're using uh, during this conversation, I came in with an open mind because in America, basically the left and right are saying that this is Trump <laughs> for good or bad reasons. But discussing this with you, I hear about a politician who's currently moderating who is filling out the cabinet with potentially respectable faces and names, is moderating foreign affairs wise with the answer you just gave, is economically liberal, has some social liberalism with LGBTQ issues, wants to get close to the White House, sounds to hate communism and not like China. And to me, as a moderate American you know, political observer, this all sounds very positive. So I'm coming out of this discussion with some cautious optimism. How would you describe how you are viewing um, this, you know, incoming administration? Are, are we cautiously optimistic? Are we dreading the future? What is your analysis heading into the, the new administration? Actually, I'm very concerned about the next month. And this is not because Milay, but this is because of the economic situation. So, and this is our daily life. It's like, Go to the supermarket and check that the uh, the milk is five ten percent more than the, the last week. So that's make me very very concerned because uh, I'm from middle class. I'm okay, but there are a lot of people that are suffering. And actually, uh, the the new administration is very aware of that about that, and it will try to avoid a social social explosion. But it happened in Chile, in Peru before the pandemic, if you remember. Uh, so uh, about the, the new administration, I, 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 I as uh, always say, um, in, in the first hundred days is you need to become, you need to be optimistic, you need to support it, uh, and then evaluate what is going on. So the first step, I think, were uh, very mature. Uh, it surprised me uh, for good. But still, the uh, the challenges are so huge uh, that even if you have the the dream team, uh, you know, you, if you have the global trotters, it's, even it will be tough to 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 be with that. But uh, I, I would say, as I actually think as a patriot, that I will I will I hope for the best. In a controversial but largely symbolic vote, Venezuela says a referendum has been overwhelmingly approved to create a new state on land in neighboring Guyana. The Esquibo region has been in dispute for over a century, and the current tensions are raising concerns of a possible military conflict in the region. CNN's David Shortel reports. A referendum held Sunday in Venezuela over the question of whether that country should essentially create a new state within the land of their neighbor Guyana, passing by a wide margin. This was in reference to the Essequibo region, a very oil-rich part of Guyana that actually makes up about two-thirds of that country's national territory. 
It's land that Venezuela has long laid claim to, but the borders of which were set back in 1899 by an international tribunal. So, of course, leaders in Guyana are very concerned in the run-up to this election, calling it an existential threat to their country and an attempted annexation. It is interesting how much of this last bit of discussion does bring me back to the transition in 2015 and 2016 when Obama was preparing to leave office and Trump was planning to come in and there was a moderation of rhetoric. There were surprisingly mature cabinet picks in that brief period and a bit of cautious optimism that turned out to have been misplaced. (laughs) So uh, we brought you on here to talk about this really interesting moment in Argentina. But as we were preparing for the discussion, we've been seeing some very dramatic news in another part of South America. So we wanted to just have the opportunity, take the opportunity to ask you very briefly about what is happening in the northern part of the continent, uh, the increasing tensions between Venezuela and Guyana that are so concerning, I think, to most observers. It seems as though Venezuela have officially made the claim that most of Guyana's territory is de jure part of Venezuela and are signaling that they're considering an invasion of the country. I, I just want to ask you, doctor, do you see this in your assessment as a very serious threat or more of a bluff? And how do you think an invasion would impact the region, whether other countries like the United States, Brazil, or maybe even the UK uh, might take some kind of action in response to an invasion? Well, I think the developments are very difficult. Oh, I, I have a lot of concern about, especially for regional stability. Uh, Latin America, general, but especially South America, is, well, we say a zone of peace. Uh, war is, is a very rare event. Um, I think these uh, steps that uh, the, the Venezuelan government has uh, pushed in, in the last weeks uh, that creates a, a lot of uncertainty about uh, the future of the of the Guyana, uh, especially the, this uh, territory of Essequibo is a territory that is uh, almost empty in terms of demographically is uh, is full of forests there are very few communities there but there are a lot of resources so and that's of course came to the, the attention of a country that uh, even don't ha- don't know how to deal with their own resources don't we don't uh, it's important to to remember that Venezuela is the, the country that they have the highest number of uh, oil reserves in the world, and at the same time, his economy is destroyed. Uh, so I think this this situation happened because uh, there is an uh, upcoming uh, uh, sentence by the International uh, Court of Justice that can uh, put uh, in in doubt uh, the uh, uh, traditional uh, requirement that our Venezuela did for the uh, uh, Sequibo. That is not new. This this is not about Maduro. This is not about Chavez. That is a kind of an old sovereignty claim by by Venezuela, uh, part of the kind of unsolved uh, colonial issues in, in the region. Uh, it's kind of is in some sense is similar to the Malvinas issue in, in, between Argentina and, and, and the UK. And this is one of the risks because Argentina, uh, at some point in 1992, uh, like declared that tried to do a kind of a small military operations to retake the the Malvinas, and that ends with the full scale war and Margaret Thatcher sending the fleet. Uh, and that is something that many people is concerned that m- maybe the uh, chief of staff of Venezuela wants to send um, wants to develop some small military operation, like put a couple of tanks on the other side of the frontier, and that creates in a Kuwait situation. Uh, uh, that's uh, there will be for sure a, a very tough reaction from the international community. Uh, Brazil is very very concerned, and uh, today uh, the president of Ujana asked for more cooperation with the SAUCOM. 
Um, the White House won't be, won't be silent on, on this issue. So I think that this, this issue is uh, one of the, I think, the most tense moments in the region in the last, uh, the last decade uh, and have the, uh, have the chance to become a, a really a destabilizer in, in the region. I, I hope that uh, dialogue and peace prevail. Uh, but the risks for military operations are still there.